Today's episode of the Watson Weekly Podcast is sponsored by Commerce Tools. Make sure your brand and your business is ready for the trillion-dollar e-commerce market. Commerce Tools, the global leader in commerce and creator of the powerfully composable mock architecture, can help you achieve bite-sized wins or upsized achievements faster than ever. Whether you are looking to reduce maintenance costs for legacy systems or put the power of AI to work for you quickly, Commerce Tools is your partner for commerce success. Go to commercetools.com to learn how to get started. It's May 20th, 2024. And this is the Watson Weekly, your essential e-commerce digest. Today on our show, Amazon AWS CEO to step down. Home Depot earnings disappoint. Sheehan rejected from NRF membership. Shopify acquires Peel Analytics founders. And finally, the Investor Minute, which contains five items this week from the world of venture capital, acquisitions, and IPOs. But first, in our shopping cart full of news, Amazon AWS CEO to step down. Big news in the Amazon universe last week as the CEO of Amazon Web Services, Adam Salibsky, stepped down. Recall that Adam went to Salesforce and then was recruited back to Amazon by Andy Jassy after becoming CEO. The new AWS CEO is Matt Garman, who has been on the sales side of AWS for several years, but also possesses a product management background, something that should make PMs across the world feel good about themselves. There is a term in the Amazon employee universe called an Amazon athlete. And once you hear it, you start to understand Amazon's mentality. Amazon attracts a certain type of builder employee that likes solving problems. Engineers don't run the company. General purpose business people do, and they get switched around to various projects. Matt Garman's tenure at AWS comes at a turbulent time. While AWS has improved its growth trajectory year over year after lean times and customer cutbacks, In 2023, artificial intelligence is still very much up for grabs. Microsoft and OpenAI have a distinct advantage. And while Amazon has set its three-layer AI architecture strategy, it has also placed a key bet in Anthropic. The next few years will determine if Amazon is the odd company out in the AI race or one of the leaders. Our second story, Home Depot earnings disappoint. Home Depot missing the revenue is not news. The home sector is down and has been for over a year. Most times, I don't listen to earnings call for the backward-looking stuff, but instead for the forward-looking. In this case, Home Depot recently announced that it would acquire SRS distribution for $18 billion, the largest acquisition in its history to tackle the home professionals market more deeply. I see it as a way to diversify away from consumers even further. And management has revealed more the company is doubling down on specific niches of professionals. The lesson in this call applied to a wide array of businesses right now. All this reflects the changing nature of retail. In the past, retailers could rely on private label credit cards and extended warranties to make an extra buck. While those days are not completely gone, top retailers need various alternative monetization tactics, and often in addition to some kind of private label card. Here are some of them. For Amazon, they're the most diversified. Subscription memberships like Prime, AWS, advertising, third-party seller fees, and fulfillment. Walmart, see above. Target has advertising and it's experimenting with selling its own brands and other retailers. Costco has its own subscription membership. Home Depot needed more. Like Lowe's, they will have ads and have recently announced the Orange Apron Media Network. With this move, they're moving further up the supply chain into fulfillment, distribution, and complex projects, and it follows similar investments in HD supply, so this is not Home Depot's first rodeo. A few points I heard on the call. With the SRS acquisition, Home Depot is niching down. Pool contractors, roofers, and landscaping. Seems like lucrative segments and reasons someone uses Home Depot. This gives Home Depot a way to serve the complex project occasion with a specialty trade pro customer. In terms of the economy, some things that are down include any type of project that needs financing, i.e. kitchen and bath remodels are all under pressure. The company has seen positive comps where they've been invested in supply chain teams. 
These complex pro capabilities will go from 17 markets by the end of the year to about 40 markets in the near future. Why are consumers deferring purchases? Well, they're either not doing them or deferring them due to interest rates and inflation pressures. Even higher income consumers think rates might come down, which contributes to deferral. Addressing this market is not just about creating distribution centers. There was also considerable talk on the call about their go-to-market motion, the marketing to professionals and attracting and serving those customers. This shows that Home Depot is not just in a build-it-and-they-will-come mode. This go-to-market motion is important when trying to gain share of wallet in a new segment. Here's another way to think about this. How does Home Depot survive the twin onslaught of Amazon and Walmart? De-emphasize the consumer market and start more deeply serving the professional. But not just any professional. Get very specific and think about their entire value chain. I feel this thinking could apply to a lot of different businesses right now. Our third story. Sheehan rejected from NRF membership. In the, you can't only believe this if you read it department, a new report out of CNBC made me look and sit up and take notice. Sheehan is working hard to become a member of NRF and apparently they have been rejected so far, which is, I guess, good news for U.S. retailers. Perhaps this could be the key for dodging regulation, a wish for IPO in the United States, and who knows what else, a veneer of legitimacy. Sheehan has been on a mission of plausible deniability and reputation washing recently, issuing good sounding statements about its supplier practices, setting up warehouses in the United States, and investing in Spark Group, the operating arm of one of the largest intellectual property licensing firms in the world. But I have a lot of questions and not a lot of answers here. Not but because I think Sheehan should be let into NRF. Honestly, it seems like a terrible idea. But because how do you make the standards clear enough and not prevent this in the future? What is the criteria exactly that could be used to keep them out? And these questions, I'll be honest, most people won't want to hear them. In a world where over half of Amazon units are likely driven by Chinese suppliers, what truly are the standards? And for Amazon itself, what do they know about their suppliers' labor practices, really? What does Amazon know about their safety records? And if the product has a poor safety record, we've already seen that Amazon could care less, mostly. In short, in an era where Amazon is appearing on stage at NRF and on the official rollout of NRF reports, what's exactly the difference? This is the company that taught the U.S. about third-party Chinese brands under an Amazon legitimacy umbrella, something that Xi'an and Timu have just taken one step further. And exactly what is different if Xi'an is part owner of Spark Group? In particular, regarding Section 321 and duties and taxes, if the worry is de minimis, how much duty and tax are enough to pay to qualify? What about the U.S. companies who every day use the same rules for survival? Is the concern about an absolute number of duties? or a relative amount to the total number of imports. Either way, outlining the criteria may just be a matter of holding back the tides. What standard could Sheehan not meet? We did a whole show on this Section 321 topic on the other podcast, The Watson Weekend. Let's put the NRF to the side for a second. What should be the standard for a U.S. listing be? Many other countries, including India and China, require joint ventures just to do business in the country and a home country to operate within. Is that enough? Wouldn't the Spark Group just IPO in that case instead, or they just create another entity? Wouldn't Sheehan easily be able to climb any wall that is put up? As my friend Nick Kaplan said the other day on that Watson weekend, when you go into the Sheehan compliance office, when you get there on the door, it says compliance slash marketing. Apparently, this compliance slash marketing group is in full effect right now. And our last story. Shopify acquires Peel Analytics founders. If you missed it, Shopify made another acquisition in the last few months that is just starting to get some light shed on it. The company is called Peel Analytics and it fits the mold of many of Shopify's smaller acquisitions. It's a capability that it wishes to see in the platform. And if you look more closely, a few things happens at the same time. Shopify did an aqua hire of the Peel Analytics employees and the Peel Analytics software was acquired by a company called Relay Commerce. First, let me get this out of the way. The fact that this software sold to a SaaS aggregator I've never heard of is probably not great for the standalone business. And this was a Shopify rescue type situation. Overall, I do think that these capabilities reflect a larger shift in direct-to-consumer from customer file growth at any cost 
to customer file optimization and activation. Although Shopify did not acquire the software, I do still think you gained something by looking at a few of the capabilities that Peel Analytics provided for its customers. In particular, filtering out any messy or junk data in the platform itself rather than off-platform, creating segmented audience groups, repeat purchasers, SKU, and region filters, which then interface with Clavio and Attentive, cohort reporting out of the box, in particular with regards to behavior of customers acquired via influencer discounts, customizable reports including LTV calculations, CAC to LTV, returning orders and customers. And while Clavio is building a CDP or customer data platform, I expect that Shopify feels audience features will be a standard part of direct-to-consumer commerce going forward and so shouldn't erode more from where Clavio is headed. Also, the elevation of customers as a key concept within Shopify seems like one of the plans. Similar to the way Shopify wanted to be the home of all checkouts and orders, I do expect Shopify has started to feel that customer segmentation and analysis should happen on platform rather than off. And who's to worry with such a move? I don't think Shopify app store companies have a tremendous amount of worry generally. On the other hand, some reporting-centric companies like Dacity, Tripleware, or Glue will likely have to move further and further up market to continue to compete. The Shopify reporting space has gotten way overcrowded in the last few years, in case you hadn't noticed, which is likely one of Shopify's own signals that the base platform needs upgrades. I do think that some of the lower-end subscription platforms could end up in the crosshairs also. This is all assuming that Shopify actually applies the Peel team to reporting and analytics challenges. How might this shape Shopify's platform? I think this affects Shopify platform is somewhat unknown. If I had to pick an acquisition that this most resembles, it would be something like Handshake was for B2B. The company acquired Glenn Coates, who is now VP of product there, in the acquisition, but nothing like the original Handshake product that he ran ever appeared in the Shopify platform And to be honest, after the acquisition, Shopify seemed to ignore B2B for several years from my point of view. And it remains to be seen what happens here. The Peel Analytics CEO is now a director of product at Shopify. And with Shopify's technology infrastructure, these new product teams can paint new solutions. It could be good for Shopify. But if analytics is ignored, then we'll just sit here wondering what happened to it all. Now a word from our sponsor, Commerce Tools. When a multi-billion dollar beauty brand's e-commerce platform neared the end of its life, the entire business was at risk, including the ability to serve customers. By switching to commerce tools and embracing a more flexible mock architecture, the retailer's vision for connecting in-store and personalized shopping experiences became a reality. The brand can now roll out new features within days, securing its position as a modern brand that uses technology to its advantage. If you're being held hostage by your technology platform and your developers have thrown up their hands, Tell them to start a free trial at commercetools.com today. It's that time, friends, for our Investor Minute. We have five items on the menu today. First, B2B food distribution platform Pepper raises $30 million Series B. Pepper, a B2B e-commerce platform for small food distributors, has raised $30 million in a Series B funding round. It operates in a competitive sector without a market leader as it gains momentum to even the playing field against Cisco and U.S. Foods. Second, Squarespace to go private in a $6.9 billion private equity deal. Global private equity fund Premira has acquired website building and hosting platform Squarespace for $44 a share to take the company private. Is this going private a growing trend? Yes, it is, my friends. Hello, big commerce. I see you. Third, Ted Baker's North American bankruptcy due to overseas failures. British apparel brand Ted Baker's North American bankruptcies were due to Authentic Brands Group European Operating Partners' failure to pay suppliers. The Global Village has implications. Fourth, Atlin raises $105 million in fundraising to power data and AI governance. Atlin's Series C round is designed to further its mission of becoming a central nervous system for data and AI. Really? Central nervous system? But seriously, Atlan has identified a lot of corporate data is not ready for AI and no platform enriches it enough with enough context and allows corporations to control what data is used in AI models or not. And finally, Swap Commerce secures $9 million of funding to launch its global product offering. Swap's offering allows companies to manage their Shopify operation tasks in one platform rather than through several disparate platforms. 
Has this not been done like 3,000 times? And today's final word of the week from May 20th, 2024 is Timu. There are reports that the high-flying Chinese marketplace Timu has started to cool on the U.S. market after seeing the difficulty Xi'an is placing with its IPO plans, as well as the regulatory issues faced by TikTok. The math looks like it's not in their favor as well. If Timu slows down its U.S. ad spending and looks for growth opportunities in other markets, it may find itself on the short end of the stick. The U.S. remains the most robust market in the world, and the company may find itself having wasted all those Super Bowl advertising dollars with not much more to show for it than some half-broken merchandise and regulatory concerns. Did you know that RMW Commerce has a brand new podcast? Check out The Watson Weekend for an unfiltered and lively e-commerce chat each week with me, Rick Watson, my co-host, Jess Lisesky, and an array of interesting guests and topics, all focused on e-commerce. You can find The Watson Weekend by searching for it on iTunes, Spotify, or YouTube. That's all for this week. Till next time, Watsonians. Hi, I'm Rick Watson, CEO and founder of RMW Commerce Consulting and host of The Watson Weekly Podcast, your essential e-commerce digest. Our production partner for the series is Citizen Racecar. The show is produced by Jose Baez, production manager, Gabrielle Montaqui. To hear new episodes of the show every Monday morning, subscribe now at rmwcommerce.com slash Watson Weekly and wherever you get your podcasts.